welcome uh, our colleagues and our students who have joined us uh, with Teams. And I welcome everyone who is following our broadcast uh, in the YouTube channel of our faculty. So uh, we are the children of the universe, you know it well, born from a stardust, right? As Hoimar von Dietfurt once put it. Uh, we, the, we are the ones who determinedly look into the sky and uh, it can be hoped that uh, to see the words of Carl Sagan, that our knowledge about the universe, our mm, about our cosmic environment will someday uh, nullify our chauvinism and earth centrism. Our outstanding guest uh, will help us to develop our cosmic perspective, a new cosmic mindset. So uh, let me introduce Professor uh, Abraham uh, Loeb, astrophysicist, astronomer from the Harvard University Department of Astrophysics, former director of this department, leader of the Galileo Project, uh, best-selling influential author of innovative and extremely interesting and important books, uh, such books as uh, Extraterrestrial or Interstellar are a uh, must read. That's that's absolutely for sure. So, Avi, I am honored to to welcome you officially and to give you the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, can you enable me to share my screen if you want me to show some slides? Uh, sure. At the moment, I'm mm -hmm. not enabled. Uh, at the top right uh, of the screen, you have this button uh, share. Yes, but it's not enabled. Only the okay. meeting organizers uh, can share at this point. Uh, okay. Uh, you should have this uh, no, possibility. It's not, an, it's not enabled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If okay. You make me a, if you make me a co-host, I should I will be able to. Mm -hmm. uh, panie Konradzie, czy pan profesor uh, ma status co-hosta? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, our um, IT specialist says that uh, you are the co-host, actually. So please try to click this button share. I cannot. And... I cannot click on it because it's mm -hmm. not clickable. It says only the. Oh, okay. 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 Mm -hmm. So if you could send me the the presentation, and I will just. No, it's uh, a very long. It will be complicated. That's why I wanted to be able to share. Uh -huh. and, uh, Okay, so can, let's. Can you please make me a host or co host or whatever? Okay, we will try to do this once again. Uh, Panie Konradzie. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just uh, please wait, uh, wait a second. So we have this traditional problems, problems as usual with computer, with Teams, etc. I can but I can send you a Zoom link that all of you can connect and that will be no problem whatsoever. I can send it to you right now. Uh, well, yeah, we know, <laughs> we know, but let's stay here. Okay, uh, Avi, you are a co-host. Okay, uh, so now you, right you made now. me a co-host. Before that, I was not, so now I can oh, share. Okay. 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 Okay, thank you. So let me just share my screen. One second. Mm-hmm. It will just take a few seconds. Of course. Right. When you click this uh, share button and scroll down, uh, there you will have at the bottom uh, the next button. Share your uh, search your computer, right? And there you you will have to uh, find your your presentation and and share it.
Przepraszamy Państwa za drobne problemy, no ale nie przeskoczymy, nie przeskoczymy tego. Znaczy przeskoczymy, ale one się po prostu zdarzają, więc przepraszamy. Czasami to może być też kwestia jakichś ustawień po prostu na komputerze już. Tak, tak. Mhm, mhm, dokładnie, dokładnie. Avi, is everything fine? Przypuszczalnie to ten sam problem, który ja miałem na początku spotkania, kiedy musiałem po prostu e, zrebutować komputer, bo Teams mi się kompletnie skraszował. Więc tutaj pewnie mamy do czynienia z tym, z tym samym. Okay, Avi, uh, I think you are with us once again. Uh, but this but time... Now, um, now you just need to re, uh, sh uh, allow me again, uh, just connect me again, because mm -hmm. now it should be wo working. Mm -hmm. uh, panie Konradzie, to jeszcze raz zróbmy ten... Uh, okay. Uh, okay, I think now mm -hmm. it, it worked. Let's yes. See. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, are you able to see my screen or not yet? Uh, not yet. Okay, one second. We can see you, but not the presentation or your screen. So all you have to do is to click this share button, scroll down and choose the option, uh, search your computer and then find your presentation. Let's see. Is it working now? Yes, we have it. Okay. Um, let's see. I guess it gives various options, but um, uh, okay. So let me put my presentation. Uh, I hope you can see it. Um, so I will be brief. Um, can you hear me? Yes, of course. Everything's okay. fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I will be brief um, for about um, half an hour or so, and then uh, I will, um, or 25 minutes, I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. Um, so what I'll describe is a new frontier that um, became possible over the past decade, and that is of interstellar objects, objects that enter into the solar system from interstellar space, from outside the solar system. And the reason I'm interested in that is because uh, there, it provides an opportunity uh, to detect um, uh, technologically manufactured objects, a tennis ball that was thrown by a neighbor, in addition to the rocks that we're used to seeing. Um, so, uh, uh, there, were, there were three, three interstellar objects that were found over the past, past decade. The first one, one on, on January, January 8th, 2014, 2014 and, and uh, it was an object roughly the size of a watermelon, half, half a meter in size, that collided with Earth and detected by U.S. government satellites. Uh, it was, unlike uh, familiar rocks, it was uh, anomalous in its speed. It was moving actually faster than 95% of the stars in the vicinity of the sun. Very fast, 60 kilometers per second outside the solar system. And moreover, it was uh, very tough. Um, it had material strength that was even tougher than iron meteorites based on the place where it exploded, low in the atmosphere. So that raised the possibility that maybe it's, it's a Voyager like a meteor. Uh, if our own spacecraft Voyager will collide with a planet like the Earth after it exits the solar system, it would look like a meteor of unusual speed and unusual material composition. 
And then uh, almost four years later, in October 19th, 2017, there was a much bigger object, object Oumuamua, uh, the size of a football field uh, that passed near Earth. And uh, it also didn't look like the rocks that we are familiar with. Uh, it, based on the reflection of sunlight, it was most likely flat, pancake-like, uh, and also uh, it uh, exhibited a non-gravitational acceleration. It was pushed away from the sun without showing any visible evaporation. So it couldn't have been propelled by the rocket effect, the way comets are. And uh, the question is, what pushed it? And uh, finally, the third object on August 29, 2019 was a comet, it's called Borisov, named after the uh, amateur astronomer who discovered it. And there were no anomalies. It looked just like a familiar comet. So two out of the three, the first two, appeared unlike the familiar rocks in the solar system. And the interesting question that this raises is, could they be technological in origin? Now, let me define an interstellar object. It's, uh, if you imagine the sun uh, in red here and an object moving, let's say, at the distance of the Earth from the sun, uh, the Earth is moving at 32 kilometers per second, 30 kilometers per second relative to the sun. But if you just increase its speed to 42 kilometers per second, uh, it would fly out of the solar system. So any object moving faster than the escape speed locally uh, must have originated in interstellar space. It cannot be bound to the sun by gravity. And as I mentioned, Oumuamua was the first one reported uh, by astronomers. Um, and um, I suggested that it may be pushed away from the sun by reflection of sunlight, just like um, a sail is pushed by wind, except here it's light that is pushing it. And for that, the object had to be very thin and nature doesn't make such thin objects. So I suggested maybe it's a surface layer of some bigger object, but not produced by nature. Um, and there is a, a play that was presented uh, a couple of months ago about my research on uh, Oumuamua called uh, A Piece of Sky. And it was written by the playwright Josh Rovetch. Um, and the hope is to feature it in New York City in a year. Um, and I would like to mention two sentences from that play. Uh, one of them uh, refers to social media, but also academia more generally. Uh, and the question is, why is childlike bullying more prevalent than childlike curiosity? And the second is my advice to young people. My advice is never pretend to be the adult in the room. Maintain your childhood curiosity. So um, two and a half years ago, the US government reported that it was the director of national intelligence reported to Congress that there are some unusual objects near Earth uh, that they cannot figure out. So there are two possibilities. Either they're not doing their job and these objects are behaving in unusual ways because they were manufactured by China or Russia or some other adversarial country. Uh, or the second possibility is that some of these objects may have arrived extraterrestrially from outside of this Earth. And to figure this out, I established, uh, I'm leading the Galileo project. Uh, by now we have an observatory that is operating at Harvard University. You can see it here. And let me show you a brief um, video that describes the various instruments in it. We are basically taking a movie of the sky 24-7, um, all times of the entire sky from one location. And we hope to make copies of this observatory and put it in many different other locations. So here, here is the video. Welcome to an overview of the Galileo Project's development site, codenamed Pigeon Run. Our instrumentation suite consists of both wide field and narrow field sensors. Wide field sensors are used for target selection and tracking, while narrow field sensors gather higher resolution data on potentially anomalous objects. Our main instrument is DALEC, 
a hemispherical array of eight infrared cameras. Next to it is the Alcor, a secondary high-resolution optical all-sky camera. Together, these instruments continuously monitor and track objects in the sky, analyzing them in real time for potential anomalous activity. This is AMOS, our acoustic monitoring omnidirectional system designed to detect and record acoustic signatures across the infrasonic, audible, and ultrasonic bands. AMOS also houses an ADS-B antenna for logging aircraft transponder data, allowing us to quickly separate known from unknown objects. Here we have Skywatch, a multi-static passive radar system designed to detect and track multiple objects simultaneously, measuring object positions and kinematics. And Pac-Man is an environmental monitoring system for measuring local weather conditions. Sensors include an anemometer, temperature and pressure sensors, a particle counter, and a flux gate magnetometer. Next up is Spectre, a radio spectrum analyzer with a wide band antenna for measuring radio and microwave emissions. Beacon is currently our only narrow field instrument. Beacon is a high resolution pan tilt zoom camera capable of 40 times optical zoom. Our instruments collect a wide range of data, all of which is fed to our computing enclosure housed beneath the Dalek and Alcor instruments. Here, data is processed and analyzed in real time. Objects detected and tracked by the wide field instruments are localized in space and analyzed for unusual characteristics. Selected targets are then sent to the Beacon PTZ for follow-up observation. Finally, data is recorded to disk and uploaded to the cloud via Starlink. These combined systems comprise the current version of the observatory class system, with many refinements, additions, and upgrades scheduled for near-term implementation at Pigeon Run. So that was a brief uh, summary. Let me move on to um, uh, a few more details. Uh, we're currently upgrading this system to make uh, to put more sensors in each observatory. We're planning to place it in many uh, sites. Uh, the next one is in Colorado. We're making a copy of the current system, and the number of copies we make will depend on how much funding we get. Uh, we also collect data from above using satellites. Uh, not just from below. Uh, and we have a plan for in the coming years how to expand this set of observatories and help figure out what these unidentified anomalous phenomena might be. Um, we published eight papers so far, and uh, we are currently getting data on uh, tens of thousands of objects every week or so, and we are analyzing it with machine learning software. So. In the coming months, we'll start having interesting results uh, in terms of whether we see any unusual objects. But what I would like to focus on is actually an expedition that I led uh, to the Pacific Ocean uh, in June 2023, just uh, less than half, half a year ago. Um, and uh, we went there for two weeks on a ship called the Silver Star. And the goal was to look for the materials from this meteor that I mentioned the, the, that came from interstellar space, trying to figure out what it was made of. And the, the story actually started from uh, uh, 2019 when, uh, uh, together with my student, Amir Siraj, we identified this meteor in uh, a catalog um, of meteors uh, published by NASA. And uh, then the U.S. government wrote this letter that you see on the left, which uh, confirms the 99.999% confidence that indeed the speed of this object uh, was high uh, so that it must have arrived from interstellar space. And uh, the government detected the fireball, the result of the explosion uh, of this object as a result of its friction on air. And uh, the government released the, the light curve of this uh, fireball, and it showed three flares separated by a tenth of a second. And what was unusual uh, about this um, meteor is that um, the, um, the flares occurred in the lower atmosphere of the Earth. Uh, and as a result, um, we could conclude that the object must have had a very high material strength because the density of air is very high and the 
pressure that this object was able to sustain uh, was much larger than all 272 space rocks that were catalogued by NASA over the past decade. Uh, before going there, we were able to localize the meteor path using uh, data from a seismometer that recorded the sound from the explosion. And from that, from the delay in the sound relative to the light, uh, we could tell the distance of the explosion from the seismometer. And you can see it in the red strip here um, that is uh, boxed within the error uh, region of the Department of Defense that was roughly 10 kilometers in size. So let me show you a few uh, photos from that expedition on Silver Star, and then I'll describe the results. So we um, went on this uh, ship, you can see the team on the deck, 28 people, and behind the team is this uh, A-frame that connected a sled uh, that we kept on the ocean floor uh, about uh, two kilometers deep. Um, so we were searching for uh, small um, uh, molten droplets, roughly a millimeter in size, the size of a grain of sand, at a depth of two kilometers across a region that was 10 kilometers large. And we used a sled with magnets on both sides to collect magnetic particles, these molten droplets, from the surface of the object when it was exposed to the immense heat uh, from the fireball. And, and the sled was connected by a cable to uh, the ship, and we went back and forth across this region of interest. So here are some photos. Um, what you see on the middle, top middle uh, and right sides are um, the sled being pulled out of the ocean. And then it was placed on the deck and we would scrape the magnets for any magnetic particles. What you see on the bottom left and middle is me jogging at the sunrise as I do on land, I, I kept uh, my routine on the ship and there was a filming crew uh, with us from Netflix. Um, uh, one out of 50 filmmakers and producers who wanted to be there, I had to select just one team and, and uh, they asked if they can film me jogging one morning and they did. Then the producer uh, asked me at the end of my jog, he said, uh, uh, Avi, it looks like you are jogging, you are running. Are you running away from something or towards something? And I said that I'm running away from many of my colleagues who have uh, very strong opinions without seeking evidence. And I'm running towards a higher intelligence in interstellar space. So here are some more photos. You can see the sled and uh, the magnets on it. They look like circles and uh, we would use, for example, a, va uh, a vacuum uh, cleaner, as you can see at the bottom, uh, to suck all of the particles. And then after that, we would dry them up and put them under a microscope. And here is the way that the sled operated on the ocean floor. It was just like mowing the lawn. Uh, this is from a video camera that was attached to it. And most of the ocean floor at a depth of two kilometers was just the mud, muck, um, but it collected magnetic particles that were there. And uh, at first the challenge was to keep the sled on the floor because it would lift up as a result of the tension in the cable. It was uh, kiting above the ocean floor. 
And then uh, after the first day, we, the engineers and navigators on the ship found a way to keep it on the ocean floor. So we started collecting uh, magnetic particles, most of which were just um, volcanic ash. Here you see a piece of rock carried for the ride. So we went uh, 20, uh, 26 times back and forth across this region with some uh, parts um, of um, the survey being way, very far away from the meteor path, which is shown here in orange. And amazingly, we were able to, I mean, after six days of looking at the mostly volcanic ash, we started noticing these uh, spherules, the, the molten droplets from meteors. And on the ship, we found 50 of them. You can see the whiteboard uh, on the bottom left here. And this is the way they looked uh, from a microscope image. They were very easily distinguishable from the background sand because they looked like metallic marbles, as you can see. And we picked them up with uh, tweezers. And this is how they looked uh, in a microscope image. My daughter asked if I can uh, put one of them on a necklace for her because they look so beautiful. And I tried to explain that they are less than a millimeter in size. And they are made mostly of iron. It's impossible to thread them. So we put them in uh, vials, just like uh, newly born babies uh, sitting in their uh, or, or sleeping in their um, uh, beds uh, within the delivery room. Uh, the delivery room here was this box, the white box, which we later shipped using FedEx. You can see the case that arrived to my home. A few days after I came back, uh, I realized that a delay of a few days is not a big deal because it took the, this material billions of years to arrive to Earth. And um, here on the left, you can see us um, uh, looking at um, the magnets to, uh, after one uh, rainy night. Actually, the funder of this mission is with um, the black uh, uh, coat, the uh, raincoat that you see next to me. And um, he provided us with one and a half million dollars, uh, Charles Hoskinson, and came for, uh, was with us on the, on the expedition. So then I brought the materials to my colleague at Harvard, Stein Jacobson, that you see here on the right side. And um, on the left is a, a summer intern, Sophie Bergstrom, that came to just shadow me as I do my science. And at some point she asked, can I help? Uh, and I said, sure. I gave her a pair of tweezers and asked her to go over the material and with a microscope to see if there are more spherules. And, Altogether, she found nearly 600 of them, 10 times more than we found on the ship. So I called her the Spheral Hunter. Uh, that's a very prestigious label to have. Um, and uh, you can see the mass spectrometer that we used um, in Stein Jacobson's lab to analyze the composition of these spherules. At first, we looked at 10% of the spherules, released the results uh, in early September. Um, three months ago, and by now we went over most of them. Here are some images of the spherules, and we made a map of where uh, the spherules were found, what was the yield of spheroid per mass collected, and uh, the yellow regions here are high yield regions, and the purple are background, and you can see that the, uh, the yellow regions are uh, closer to the meteor path. So we believe that we probably searched in the right region. And uh, these are images of spherules from the inside. Uh, it looks like they, are, they have spheres inside spheres. And just like Russian dolls, uh, the small spheres must have solidified first, and then they were engulfed with molten iron that glued them together. Here is a spheroid that looks like a soccer ball um, imaged with an electron microscope, uh, electron scanning device. Um, and um, here is a spheroid that is a composite of uh, three spheres that they came together. 
Uh, this was the largest we had, 1.3 millimeters in size, and it was in a yellow region. So we analyzed it first, and we found that it has iron isotopes different from rocks on Earth, uh, basalts, for example. Uh, but most importantly, it has a composition of elements that uh, looks very different from the standard solar composition. So that standard solar composition is marked by one, uh, in the vertical axis here on this plot. And what you see from the left to the right are elements in the periodic table, starting from lithium all the way to uranium on the right side. And um, uh, what we find is the abundances of many elements, in particular beryllium, lanthanum, uranium, are, are hundreds of times larger than the standard or composition. So we this was never reported before in the literature, such, such a, so we had to invent a name for it. We called it Belau. And the idea is that it, it may um, uh, be the smoking gun of a, an extra solar origin of this uh, meteor. So here are five uh, spherules that show the Belau type composition. and. We show it as a function of volatility of the elements. And as you go to the right, elements can evaporate more easily during an explosion, an air burst. And indeed, we find elements on the right-hand side to be less abundant, implying that these Belau-type spherules came from an air burst, from an explosion in the atmosphere, because we lost volatile elements in them. So the question is, what is their origin? And one possible natural origin is uh, the crust of an exoplanet, a planet around another star, because we don't see this abundance pattern on Earth, Mars, the Moon, or asteroids. So one possibility is that it's an exoplanet, a planet around another star that had a molten magma ocean. Um, and uh, then some elements, um, uh, segregate to the core of the planet because of their affinity to iron, uh, which sits at the core. And the elements that are left behind are the ones that we find overabundant in this uh, below type uh, spherules. And uh, of course, the Earth started as a magma ocean, but uh, it didn't end up with those abundances. And one uh, path to uh, getting rocks with uh, such an abundance into interstellar space, which is a real challenge, is by disruption of a planet like the Earth near a common star, like a dwarf star. It turns out that if you take the Earth and put it next to the Sun, uh, the Sun will not destroy the Earth by the gravitational force, by the tidal force. This is the same tidal force that the Moon exerts on our ocean, except the Sun is much more massive. But the sun is not dense enough. It's less dense than rock. So it cannot break up the Earth. However, if you consider the more common stars, dwarf stars, uh, they are 10 times less massive than the sun and 10 times smaller than the sun. So they are actually 100 times denser than the sun. And they are denser than rock. And they can destroy a planet like the Earth if it passes close to them. So what we propose is if this object was natural, it's most likely uh, originated from a disruption of an Earth-like planet when it came close to the most common type of stars, dwarf stars. What happens is the planet would get spaghettified. It would get destroyed into a stream of rocks, and half of its mass would be expelled to interstellar space. It turns out the speed you get out of this process is just 60 kilometers per second. Uh, the typical um, speed uh, that we calculated appears to be comparable to the measured speed of this uh, interstellar meteor. But of course, there is also a possibility that this um, object was artificial in origin. To find that out, we have to, to recover bigger pieces of the object, so we're planning to do another expedition where we would have tools to find bigger objects. Uh, we now know where to look. 
So this uh, expedition was risky. There were many potential failure points uh, in terms of securing one and a half million dollars, in terms of getting the engineers and navigators to be engaged uh, in, in building the sled that would work, in finding the, the spherals uh, from this meteor, uh, and in getting the attention of uh, my colleague at Harvard, who basically gave up on what he was doing before and decided to dedicate his research team to studying the Belau composition. So, in a way, this was like a miracle for me that, um, and, and the lesson is, of course, without uh, searching, you would never find anything. So, uh, it's important to take risks in science. And we are currently planning the next expedition to find bigger pieces. Here you see an image on the last day uh, of the expedition as uh, I was looking at the sunset uh, together with Art Wright, uh, the navigator of this uh, ship, who has a lot of experience. He's 85 years old and was a commander of a destroyer du during the Vietnam War. And uh, everything he said uh, was right during the expedition. And uh, he is um, an amazing person to, to work with. And so we are currently planning the next expedition. And uh, I just wanted to finish with some guiding principles uh, that I came across uh, as a result of this uh, expedition. Um, so first of all, of course, that's uh, uh, the scientific method. Uh, it's important to follow evidence by collecting data with state-of-the-art instruments uh, and these instruments need to be fully under control and well calibrated. A second is uh, to follow the principle of FIFA, the Football Association. You can listen to eyewitness testimonies. In the case of FIFA, it's the players in the field who might argue that they scored a goal. But the decision by the referees is based on cameras. Um, so you really need to use uh, instruments to make up your mind and not listen to people. We all know that uh, different people who attend the, the same event, like a car accident, give very different reports. Third is to follow the principle, again, from sports that is advocated by basketball uh, coaches. Uh, keep your eyes on the ball, not on the audience. And that's why I don't have uh, any footprint on social media. And the other thing I noticed, there are many uh, bloggers and science popularizers who are pretending to protect science, but they are not practicing science. If you check their record, they call themselves astrophysicists, scientists, but they, some of them never published a single scientific paper over the past decade. So they are just like spectators looking at a soccer match and telling the players how to pass the ball. How dare they? And of course, they resist facts that disagree with popular view and their models. But my point is they are not really practicing science. Don't listen to them. And personally, I prefer to avoid mud wrestling with uh, critics because any mud wrestling gets you dirty. And instead, I prefer to rise to the greatest heights. Uh, this is the lesson I learned from eagles. Uh, an eagle often has a crow picking at its neck, sitting on its back. And instead of fighting the crow away, the eagle rises to the greatest heights where the oxygen level is too low for the crow to survive. So the crow drops off the eagle's back. And for me, it's the greatest heights of scientific practice. My hope is that some of these will drop off my back. That's it. And I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Let me see how I stop my, uh, the screen sharing. Okay, so now we're back and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Uh, Avi, thank you so much. It was 
really extremely interesting, inspiring lecture. Thank you for sharing your your discoveries and thoughts uh, with us. Uh, of course, uh, friends, uh, if you have any questions to our guest, please write them down uh, in the chat box or just turn your mm, microphone on just to ask uh, the question out loud. Of course, Avi, I have uh, I have many questions, so let me let me just uh, just start and to share my my. Uh, thoughts, opinions, and etc. Uh, when it comes to Oumuamua, well, this very special medium with a message, right? Uh, it's possible origin. Uh, I must say that this is the kind of scientific discovery that makes my imagination, my curiosity, search and boil. Yes, this is it. And as you claim in your book, um, Extraterrestrial, uh, that Oumuamua may be a part of some extraterrestrial uh, technological equipment or a relic from a distant civilization. You know, my enthusiasm here is <laughs> growing rapidly. And um, let's try to, to speculate or, or maybe predict. Uh, what do you expect to be detected next in our space environment that could be uh, you know, that could once again make us raise some questions about our cosmic neighbors, intelligent presence in our cosmic neighborhood. Yeah, so um, when you observe an object like Oumuamua, let's say over one decade of time, and uh, you can do some statistics and say, you know, suppose you have a much better telescope uh, that can be more sensitive, and by that you increase the volume that you are surveying, uh, because you can see to greater distances, uh, how many such objects should you see? And uh, in fact, we do have a new telescope uh, called the Rubin Observatory in Chile. It will start mm -hmm. providing data in 2025. Uh, it was funded by the National Science Foundation uh, in the US, uh, cost more than a billion dollars. It has a camera of 3.2 billion pixels, and it will survey the southern sky every four days. So the calculation is that it should find an Oumuamua-like object every month. And, uh, and of course, that would be very interesting because now we have the web telescope, we have other instruments that we can use to learn more about such objects. And so I think we will know much more about this population. Instead of agonizing that we didn't get enough data about Oumuamua, we can look forward mm -hmm. and in fact, with my students and postdocs, we de developed the software that will allow us to de detect those interstellar objects and, and then analyze what uh, their properties are, um, including data from the web telescope. So that's what I'm looking forward to now. With respect to Oumuamua, there is a possibility, for example, that it was a broken piece. I wrote a paper about that, a broken piece of a so-called Dyson sphere. That's that's mm -hmm. a, a mega structure that was uh, uh, imagined by Freeman Dyson about 60 years ago. He said that, um, of course, we know that the Earth um, uh, occupies a tiny fraction of the sky around the sun. And so we are collecting on Earth about uh, one part in 100 million of the output of energy from the sun. So even when we talk about clean energy, it's just 10 to the minus eight of the energy output of the sun and an advanced civilization might decide to harvest uh, most of that energy by surrounding a star like the sun with a, a structure, a mega structure. And, mm -hmm. um, and the, the most practical approach would be to put some um, light sails that are hovering above the star and make this structure out of tiles, uh, basically small, uh, um, pieces um, that hover and cover the sky of the star. And the issue is that uh, after a few billion years, the star evolves to become brighter. And so such uh, pieces will be thrown into interstellar space. They are marginally bound to start with because they are balancing gravity by the radiation from the sun and the radiative force. And so the idea is that you could uh, expel such pieces, and perhaps Oumuamua was a piece of a broken Dyson sphere. That's one possibility. But um, we don't know, and I think the best way to 
proceed is rather than speculate about its origin, get more data about future objects like it. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you very much. Our friend uh, Alexandra um, have a question. Uh, please uh, turn your microphone on. You can turn yes. your video on also so I can see. Yeah. <laughs> oh, OK, uh, I am currently like a bit undisposed, but that's fine. I can show okay. it myself. Hi. Um, so I would have a question regarding like uh, uh, actually two questions like when it comes to the origin uh, I know you just said that we should m focus perhaps more on like um, other objects that could appear but if it comes to the origin I was wondering like m when it comes to um, where it like it came from I read some articles about this uh, about a more and more before but, like is there any possibility that for example mm, there was an object that was near um, another star that perhaps exploded and since it was pretty far away the light that came through has not been observed by current scientists because we were just like they were just simply not alive or we didn't have the technology um, that could potentially cause like let's say even a dwarf planet to melt to the point that like we had a more more in our solar system right now and the second question would be um, if like this because we call it a comet, right? If, if it still exists, because I also read that um, upon coming into the solar system by the sun um, up to coming to Earth, it lost around 90, 93% of its mass. So is it like, do we think it still exists that we could still observe it in any way or not really? Right, okay, but the, for the first question you asked, um, typically when a star explodes, the ejecta from the star can indeed the you know, they carry a few solar masses. Uh, you don't even need the pre-existing debris around the star to be kicked out because the ejecta from the exploding star is much more massive. You know, you have much more mass there. And, and it's a few times the mass of the sun, depending on the star. It could be even tens of times the, ma the mass of the sun. Now, this ejecta usually from an exploding star moves at thousands of kilometers per second, a very high speed, a much higher than uh, the tens of kilometers per second that are associated with objects like Oumuamua. In fact, Oumuamua uh, was uh, at rest in the local standard of rest. That's the frame of reference that you get to when you average over the random motions of the stars in the vicinity of the sun. So it was not only not moving very fast, it was almost at rest. And, um, that was an anomaly because only one in 500 stars are so much at rest in that frame. So it cannot come from the eject of an exploding star, but um, but maybe there was another process that created it. Like I was referring to the disruption of planets by dwarf stars, but then you need to account for a very large population. Um, so it's possible. It's possible that it came from a natural origin, but then the question is, well, it didn't look like a comet. We didn't really see any evaporation from it. So when you mentioned 90% was evaporated, that's in a, okay, so the, the, the point to understand is my colleagues, uh, astronomers of the mainstream, they said, no, 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 it's a natural object. Uh, we can try and explain the anomalies. So the fact that we didn't see it evaporating is because it's made of pure hydrogen. That's one team uh, suggested. If it's made of pure hydrogen, you can't see the cometary tail, then indeed 90% of it would be lost. In fact, I wrote a paper subsequently showing that all of it would evaporate during its interstellar journey. Such an object cannot really survive, okay? Mm -hmm. And so the authors of that suggestion said, oh yeah, we were wrong, it can't be a pure hydrogen iceberg. And by the way, a pure hydrogen iceberg has to be made in a molecular cloud. It cannot be made in a solar system type environment because it's made just of hydrogen. And um, um, so um, we have never seen such a thing before. So then another group said, oh, it's a nitrogen iceberg. And just a chunk of frozen nitrogen that was made out of uh, chipping a piece of the surface of a planet like Pluto that has solid nitrogen on the surface. And we did a calculation and there is just not enough solid nitrogen in the Milky Way galaxy to, bring, to make a, a large enough population of objects like that. And we showed that very clearly. Uh, so um, then another group said, oh yeah, it's actually a dust bunny, a collection of dust particles, a cloud of dust, that is a hundred times less dense than air. 
And the problem is if it's 100 times less dense than air, it wouldn't survive coming close to the sun because it wouldn't have the material strength when it gets heated to hundreds of degrees. And then there was another, so people just came up with suggestions like that. And every time they came up with it, they said problem solved, but they were just addressing the issue of not seeing cometary tail. And they did not address the issue of why the object was flat. Why was it in the local standard of rest? And so anyway, um, it's not by any means, it's not clear that the object was natural because the the ideas that were put forward for natural origin involved something that we've never seen before, okay? And my point is, if it's something that we've never seen before, it might as well be artificial. And um, uh, therefore, you know, it's just like a, a cave dweller uh, finding a cell phone. Uh, the cave dweller, if the cave dweller is an adult, then uh, they would say, um, Oh, it's just a rock of a type that we've never seen before. But the, if the cave dweller has a kid, the kid might say, wait a minute, let me press some buttons here and notice that it's not a rock. <laughs> so uh, the whole point is, as I mentioned at the beginning, people forgot to, to maintain their wonder. Uh, they want to kill anything that doesn't, you know, any idea that doesn't look like something that was thought about before. And I find that unfortunate because it's not just them saying, okay, well, I prefer another option, but I will allow this other alternative to be on the table so we can check it later. No, they say it should be removed of the table. Don't talk about it. They ridicule it. And moreover, when I go to the Pacific Ocean to look for the materials, they say, you will not find anything. I come back with materials. They say, what you found is coal ash. <laughs> and we showed by looking at 60 elements from the periodic table that it's definitely not coal ash in the latest analysis, definitely not. And so I have this struggle, continuous struggle of people trying to be negative. Why are you trying to be negative? Why not let me finish the analysis? I'm doing all the heavy lifting. I'm doing the scientific work the way it should be done, collecting evidence, looking what it shows. Why, why do people have this? Uh, motivation to kill, yeah. to step on every flower that rises above the grass level. That's my main uh, complaint about the way science is done right now. Maybe it's more, mm -hmm. it's also in the humanities, in academia in general, but it's mm -hmm. unfortunate because what it does to the young people is worse. I mean, I, I, I'm, my skin is titanium by now. I don't care about what these people say, but, but when the young people see it, the message they get is you should not deviate from the beaten path if you want to have a job. Mm -hmm. And that is very bad for innovation in science. Right. Really classic. I mean, classic situation. Uh, in the uh, academia. Uh, right, some people claim that you are prone to making extraordinary claims without good evidence, etc. One of the scholars from Arizona said that you are polluting uh, good science. I mean... I should tell you one thing about this. Why this is done? So what this person did is actually approach my students, postdocs, collaborators, and send them personal emails to dissuade them from being engaged in the research. Can you believe that? Uh, he is actively harassing them. And of course, we, we ignore him, but he goes around and says false, makes false claims. And I was on a podcast. If you want to go point by point, uh, there was a podcast last week uh, by Brian Keating where I addressed point by point everything he said. But mm -hmm. the point is that it's really like terrorism, you know, he is attacking oh, yeah. and attacking and attacking without having access to the materials. We are just trying to do our science, you know, exactly. and making mm -hmm. false claims and then reporters, what reporters do, they think it's just like a political debate where you have to show both sides. Well, it's not a political debate. One side is doing all the work. You know, it took us a year to plan this expedition and six months to analyze the materials. We are doing mm -hmm. all the work and he just sits on his chair and makes false accusations. Mm -hmm. And I find that really damaging to the way science is done. So Absolutely. I think it's really unfortunate that he's given the, the attention, even though he's not doing it, like he, is, he doesn't have access to the materials. What is he talking about? 
And we, we analyze, you know, it takes a lot of time and effort to do the work that we are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I just, and, and of course, people who want to move on and forget about anything new are cheering because they say, let's move on. It's just a rock of a type that we've never seen before. Case closed. But this is the way by which you never learn anything new. And mm -hmm. you can dismiss anything this way. Like if you said everything in the sky must be stones, the way this guy says and others, then you would say there is no dark matter because you cannot explain the dark matter with stones. Mm -hmm. Just the way they said this meteor is is not from, uh, it's, it's basically from the solar system. The government data is wrong. That's what he said, that uh, the measurement was off by a factor of three by the U.S. Space Command. And the U.S. Space Command, you know, it gets funded three times more than NASA. It's supposed to advise the U.S. president of any ballistic missile coming from North Korea. They're serious people and they yeah. have serious uh, equipment. So just, you know, for someone to say that, that the government doesn't know what they're doing and what I'm doing is just coal ash, you know, and I am pol I'm polluting the conversation by, by doing the scientific work of collecting evidence. Like, what is he talking about? Yeah, it's an absurd. Absolutely. Okay, so just let's leave the critics far, far away. Okay, yeah, I let's... need to go uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. So the uh, so the last question, if I may, uh, let's get back to your to your uh, basic claims. Uh, in your book, uh, Interstellar, we can read these absolutely truly momentous words: "We are not alone." Right. Uh, could you explain it? What exactly should we understand by this? And what does it practically mean to our awareness, to our understanding of ourselves? What practical implications uh, that observation has? Right. So um, I think it's arrogant of us to believe that Albert Einstein was the smartest scientist who ever lived since the Big Bang. Uh, because there are tens of billions of stars like the sun in the Milky Way galaxy alone, about a trillion galaxies in the entire universe. And most of the stars formed billions of years before the sun and a Voyager like um, a spacecraft takes less than a billion years to go from one side of the Milky Way to the other side. So there was plenty of time for civilizations that predated us by more than a billion years to reach us. And that could be just because their star formed a billion years before the sun, you know, that uh, most stars did that. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, you know, when Enrico Fermi asked, where is everybody? That was presumptuous because he was not engaged in the search. And we really need to look for telescopes because space is vast. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm uh, advocating for doing the scientific work is because it will change the future of humanity. It will uh, exactly. uh, uh, allow us to aspire to do better because mm -hmm. right now there are two wars going on, as you know, from your... Uh, proximity to Ukraine and, right. um, and, um, and um, you know, we're spending $2 trillion every year on military budgets worldwide. And if we were to allocate this uh, funding to space exploration, um, we could send a, a, a CubeSat towards every star in the Milky Way galaxy within this century, billions mm -hmm. of them. So it's just a question of priorities. And I think yeah. that the wake up call for us to change priorities uh, would most likely come from finding that we are not alone by, you know, and, and the approach we took in the past to look for radio signals, I, need, I think is misguided because it's just like waiting for a phone call. Nobody may call you when you are listening just for several decades. Uh, and a much be better approach is to look for objects because they are still around. You know, it's just like um, plastics in the ocean that keep accumulating over time because they move these objects move at speeds that are well below the escape speed from the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, and um, so we just started over the past decade and let's uh, make it a priority and look around. And, um, you know, I believe, I mean, the, I, there is this belief in the messianic uh, age in the future where we will be at peace and so forth. And in my uh, book, The Messiah, is actually mm -hmm. from an exoplanet, from far, far is extraterrestrial because yeah. once we realize that we are all in the same boat and there, that we are not alone, first of all, it will give a meaning to our existence, uh, just like uh, finding a partner in our private life. Yeah. But also, 
it will perhaps convince us, give us a shock, a cultural shock, and convince us that we better work together uh, mm -hmm. because we are all in the same boat. Yeah, I fully agree. Wow, that's the idea. Okay, Avi, thank you so much for your time, for extremely interesting, inspiring uh, lecture, discussion. It was an honor and great, great pleasure. So thank you uh, very much once again. Thank you and for having Yeah, please, 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 of course. No, thanks for having me. Um, and uh, I, I really enjoyed the interaction. Thank you very much. And one more thing, uh, the words to our audience, uh, the words of our outstanding guest, Professor Abraham uh, Loeb. When you get a chance, step outside and admire the universe. Okay, thank you very much and see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you, bye. Thank Bardzo you, Państwu bye. dziękuję za obecność i za aktywność. Za aktywność.